Um, but if this is God, what God wants me to do and share what I've learned, then that's what I want to do. Uh, big thanks to Jordan. He had to put a lot of scriptures together and some pictures. I know it's a lot of work, and he, he helped me out. I uh, want to give a props to my son, Cameron. He uh, tried to give me some encouragement tonight. He said that, don't be nervous. We, you play the bass and the drums in front of the same people, so it's just uh, so. Thanks to Cameron for the big word of encouragement. So now I've been studying Bible prophecy for a few years now. Um, I really developed a passion and desire to learn more, because once you start seeing this, these things, the Bible really starts to come out of life, and you just know that it's it's true. Um, I'm going to share some things that you probably haven't heard of before. I want to share some things that might contradict what you have been taught, but that's okay. This is not a salvation issue, and that's the main thing. Um, but sometimes we need to tr change our traditions, those things that have been brought, uh, taught generation after generation, and we need to change those to fit the Bible, not try to change the Bible to fit our traditions. So I just ask that you keep an open mind, like Steve has already pointed out, and take this home, study it out. Um, you'll you'll really find it um, pretty amazing. Uh, so if I can challenge you to study the word, then that's my goal for tonight. I'm going to ask Brother Benny if he'd pray over the word. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you tonight, Jesus, with thankful hearts, thanking you, Jesus, for your great love and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for dealing with Brother Kenny, Jesus, you've laid the message upon his heart, Lord, we believe we should all take an inventory of our own lives, see how we are, our, our walk with you, if we're ready to meet you, Jesus, and if we really, like our pastor said this morning, are we really, do we really have a desire in our heart to see so saved. I believe with all my heart, Lord, that is the message of the hour to win, to win the loss at any cost. Our pastor brought, uh, quoted a message this morning, Jesus, one of my favorite scriptures. He said, he that wins souls is wise and shall shine as a ferment forever. Help us to be wise, Lord win souls, Jesus. Give each one of us a greater desire for, for souls, Lord, not just for our family, but for the unsaved, the loved ones, Jesus. We each one have so many in our own family. Lord, if you would come tonight, perhaps they wouldn't even be ready. Pray you will deal with our, with our hearts, especially, Jesus. Give us a greater desire, Lord, for souls. Pray you anoint Brother Kenny tonight, Jesus. I know somewhat how he feels. He's nervous, no doubt. I'm nervous even standing here myself. But, Lord, you have him to realize that he can do all things through Christ which strengthens him. May he speak exactly that which we need to hear. We just don't want to hear something to make us feel good. We want to hear the truth, Lord, regardless what it is. If it's maybe step on our toes, he may bring something, Lord, that we may not even agree with, but we studied it out. I'm sure, Lord, he'll be able to back it up with your word. And just an anointing, Jesus, to speak your word and on our ears and minds to receive what you have for us, Lord. We believe this service is ordained of God. We believe it with all of our hearts. Jesus, touch every heart in life and save those that need to be saved of our families. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I get a few ushers to pass out some pens and papers in case anybody wants to take notes? We're going to have a lot of scriptures um, tonight, so it's pro and I'm going to be reading from NIV, some King James, so it's probably the easiest thing to do is to follow along on the screen, because I'm going to move pretty quickly so we can get through all the material. Uh, so, 
Why do we have Bible prophecy? Well, one reason is to prove that the Bible is true. Another one is to increase our faith. John 14, 29, Jesus said, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So we are living in the most prophetic times, and we will see amazing things happen in our lifetime. And the reasons we are seeing so many things right now is because we are at the time of the end. Daniel 12, 4 tells us, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then again in Daniel, Daniel 12, 9, it said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So just because we're seeing and understanding things right now, it doesn't mean that we are more spiritual. It doesn't mean we are smarter than the ones that who came before us. It just means that God has put end-time prophecy in the hands of you and I so that we can bring revival before his coming. So people say, does anybody really understand prophecy? We hear this, we hear that. But the Bible tells us in Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Then again in Revelations 10, 7, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So there's approximately a thousand prophecies concerning Jesus' second coming. So almost 27% of the Bible is prophecy. So I think it's important that God is trying to tell us, and we need to understand what he's trying to tell us. Uh, all the information I'm going to share tonight, I have learned through End Time Ministries. It was founded by Brother Baxter, Irvin Baxter. Uh, you've probably seen him on Daystar or TBN. And the, one of the reasons I believe so much in his teachings, or teaching, uh, is his past credibility of, of Bible prophecy. So I'm going to read this right from their website on one of the things that he predicted would come to pass and did. In 1968, Irvin predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. He emphasized that this event would be the catalyst that would usher in the New World Order. Eighteen years later, in 1986, he documented these teachings in his first book, A Message for the President. And he founded End Time Ministries, Incorporated. Then in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. East and West Germany was reunited, and we've heard continually about the New World Order ever since. Now, I'm not going to go through this prophecy and explain that one tonight, but he did predict it, and it did come true. So this is not a fly-by-night ministry. Uh, he's been studying prophecy for 47 years. One of the things that End Time Ministries is doing, they just set up a prophecy college in downtown Jerusalem last fall. So the same things I'm going to share with you tonight are the same things the Jews are learning in downtown Jerusalem. So uh, they also have a radio program called Politics and Religion. Um, I, I highly recommend it if you can listen to them. They're, you can get on their website and see all the radio stations that they're um, on. You can dial in from your iPads, your iPhones, your computers. And it's 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, and you will, you will hear everything from the New World Order, uh, the Israel, the Pope, the Temple Mount, and everything that you probably won't hear in your everyday news, they will cover. So I highly recommend this if you enjoy Bible prophecy. I also want to caution everyone uh, to not get so overwhelmed on um, what you hear on Facebook and the Internet that you get confused on what you believe. Always remember, if a prophecy is in the Bible, it's going to come to pass. Amen. There's no changing it. So if you don't know where to turn, turn to the Bible. So my title for this lesson tonight is God's Prophetic Timeline. So I'm going to show you where we are currently, where we are headed, and what is left in Bible prophecy. We're going to touch on several items, some in more detail than others, but I want to give you just enough information of what is ahead and challenge you to think. So do we, yeah, we have that uh, up there. So the first thing we're going to go over is the confirmation of the covenant. For the Abrahamic Covenant, this is the peace treaty between Israel and the Palestines and the international community. This will establish the final borders of Israel. It will place the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement under international control and allow the building of Israel's third temple. Then we're going to talk about a war that's coming. It's called the Sixth Trumpet War, war or World War III. Now, there are seven trumpets in the Bible. I won't have time to explain those tonight. But first trumpet is World War I. Second trumpet is World War II. 
we're going to be talking about the sixth trumpet. Um, and then three and a half years in the seven-year period that we're going to be talking about, the Antichrist is going to come on and stand in the temple. It's going to claim to be God or the ultimate authority. And then there's going to be a great tribulation. This is only three and a half years, and we're going to show that in Scripture tonight. And at the end of that seven-year period, it's going to be Armageddon. It's going to be the seventh trump, and this is what we're all looking for, Jesus' return. So how do we know we have a seven-year period of time that starts with the confirmation of covenant that hasn't happened yet? Well, there's a prophecy in Daniel called Daniel's 70th week. Now, this will probably be, might be a little hard to grasp if you're a little challenged at math, but we'll get through it. <laughs> but if, if you take it home and sit down and, and look at the scriptures and study it out, it, it'll start coming to you. It took me a little bit. Now, the NIV is the, I found the easiest to understand when going through this prophecy. So we have a slide, and it's going to, the entire 70 weeks prophecy uh, contains the following. Foretold when the Messiah would come to earth the first time, it proved the identity of the Messiah. It foretold the crucifixion. It foretold the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. It prophesied the event that would trigger the final seven years to Armageddon, proved clues to the identity of the Antichrist, and established the seven-year timeline to end-of-age events. This prophecy gives us, is given to us in three segments. So let's begin by looking at Daniel 9, 24. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So what is meant by seventy-sevens? God is telling us that there will be 77 year periods of time in this prophecy. And how do we know each sevens is seven years? Well, in Daniel 9, 27, it says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So the verse states, the event called the abomination of desolation will occur in the middle of the last seven. Amen. So if we can see how long this last seven is, then all we have to do is multiply by two to know how long the full period of seven is. Easy enough, right? So Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24, 15, 21, that the abomination of desolation would start at the Great Tribulation. Now there are six different scriptures that say the Great Tribulation will last three and one half years. We're going to talk about the Great Tribulation in just a little bit. But I'm going to give you the scriptures and the times just really fast. Daniel 9, 7, 25 says time, times, and half a time. Revelation 13, 5 says 42 months. Daniel 12, 7 says time, times, and half a time. Revelation 11, 2 says 42 months. Revelation 11, 3 says 1260 days. And Revelation 12, 14 says time, times, and half a time. Therefore, if the last half of the seven is three and one half years, then the first half has to be three and one half years. This means the entire 77 is seven years long. Obviously, the other 69 sevens are also each seven years long. So this lets us know that we are looking at 70 seven-year periods of time, and seven years times 70 equals 490 years. One way to remember this is one prophetic week equals seven literal years. So a week is a period of time. It's not like our week. Like Abraham Lincoln said, four score, he, score was a period of time. Same thing. Week is a period of time. So let's look at Daniel 9.25. It reveals that the 490 years begins with the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. So the prophecy is given in three segments. The verse explains that the prophecy is given in seven sevens, which is seven times seven is 49. Then we have 62 sevens, which is 434 years. And then in Daniel 29, 27 states that it will be a final seven years. So this prophecy is given in three segments totaling 490 years. The order is 49. 434 and 7. So what is important to understand is this last 7, which hasn't begun yet. 
So Daniel 9.26 tells us that the 434-year segment will end with two major events. Okay, this is the first two gaps. It's going to tell us when these first two periods. So after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The war will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. So this passage states that the anointed one, which is the Messiah, will be cut off after the end of the 69th seven. Then it says the Messiah is to be cut off. The temple and the city of Jerusalem will be destroyed. So we know that Jerusalem was destroyed in, by the Romans in 70 AD. And the prophecy specifically says the Messiah would come and be cut off before Jerusalem was destroyed. So we know that the Messiah had to come before 70 AD. Jesus came, fulfilled every single one of the prophecies about the first coming of came and then was cut off like the prophecy stated being crucified would certainly meet uh, qualify for being cut off proof that Jesus was the Messiah Amen. so according to verses 26 and 27 that we just read two things were to happen after the 483 years and before the final seven years the Messiah was to be cut off Jerusalem and the temple was to be destroyed Jesus was crucified somewhere between 26 AD and 38 AD Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So notice we have 30 to 40 years between these two events. Now this is between the 69th seven, which is the first two segments of time, and the 70th seven, which hasn't started yet. So this is obviously the reason the prophecy was given in three segments. If there was no gap, then the prophecy could be a 90 year prophecy. So instead we are told that there would be 49 years, 434 years and seven years. Now, the length of this gap is not. However, we know today that it's about 2,000 years, and we still live in that gap period right now. But the final seven years can begin at any time. So, we've already proven that one seven in prophecy equals seven years. So, the final seven years of this prophecy is described in Daniel 9 27, which we read and we'll read again. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of that seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So there's a lot of information in this verse. So we have five questions. Who is he that will confirm the covenant? What is the covenant? What is the confirmation of the covenant? And what is meant by stopping the sacrifices? And what is this event we call the abomination of desolation? So the he that will confirm the covenant, well, that's an easy question because he does three things. He confirms the covenant, he causes a sacrifice and oblation to cease, and he sets up abomination of desolation. Daniel 11.21 states that the Antichrist will be the prince of the covenant. We'll read that now. And in stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peacefully and obtain the kingdom of flatteries. And with the arms of the flood will be overthrown, flown from before him, and shall be also the prince of the covenant. So the Antichrist will be the one to confirm the covenant. Now, when the peace treaty is signed, we will probably not know when the Antichrist is. He will probably be involved, or probably a lot of um, people involved. We will not probably not know who who he is um, when this confirmation of the covenant starts. So one states, and an arm shall stand on his part. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of the strength, pay the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that makes us desolate. So the Antichrist and his partners causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So we know that the Antichrist confirms the covenant, the Antichrist causes the sacrifice and oblation to stop, and the Antichrist places the abomination of desolation. So he, in Daniel 9 27, is the Antichrist. So what is the covenant that we keep talking about? Well, in Genesis 15, 18, it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Of the Bible, God made a covenant with Abraham that the holy land would be given to his descendants for a homeland. So this is referred to the Abrahamic covenant, a peace treaty. So what is the confirmation of this covenant? If the covenant is God's promise that Abraham's descendants would live in the promised land, then what is the confirmation? 
We've already proven that the end of Christ is he. Follows that he is the one who will confirm the covenant. So in other words, the end of Christ will confirm Israel's right to a homeland in the promised land. So what is meant by stopping the sacrifices? Well, the Middle East Peace Treaty will place the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement between Muslims and Jews, according to Revelations 11, 1 through 2. Let's read that. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God in the altar. Because it was given to the Gentiles, they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now that 42 months is also three and a half years. Now Israel will be allowed to build her third temple without disturbing the Muslim holy places. Sacrifices will be offered just like they were in the Old Testament. And these sacrifices, that the, these are the sacrifices the Antichrist will stop at the three and a half year mark, end of the seven year period, uh, probably at the animal rights groups like PETA or something. So they will stop the animal sacrifices. So what is this event called the abomination of desolation? It appears many times in scripture, in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said the abomination of desolation would stand in the holy place. Now the holy place is the temple, or at least the temple mount. And the apostle Paul described this in more detail in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and a man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he said the second coming of Jesus would not occur until the man of sin, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist, was revealed. He went on to say the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God, claiming to be God. So the Bible says that the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist will be revealed, but not to the whole world. Most of the world will never know he's the Antichrist, but to those people who walk with God, who understand the prophecies of the Bible, we will know. So when this great tribulation begins, that's when the mark of the beast is going to be instituted. We know the temple has to be built before the middle of the seven-year period because the Antichrist can't stand in the temple, claiming to be God if there's no temple. He can't stop the animal sacrifices if they haven't started. Uh, as soon as this peace agreement is signed, one of the things that End Time Ministries is doing is they're sending a magazine to all of Israel and Judea, Samaria, um, warning them of another Jewish holocaust that's coming. And you can read about this in Mark 13, 14 through 23. I won't take the time to read it now, but uh, that's one of the amazing things that they're doing. They're really reaching out to the Jews. And now we know tomorrow is the last of the blood moons for the Tetrad four blood moons in a row. We know significant has happened with the nation of Israel. Uh, 1967 blood moon, this is when Israel regained Jerusalem in the Temple Mount. Hallelujah. Could it be that this last blood moon we see a signing of the peace treaty? Starts building their temple. Now, this could happen this year, this could happen next year and still coincide with the blood moon. So you may be thinking, if we can tell when Jesus is going to return, then people can do whatever they want until close to seven years. But the Bible says this, Watch therefore, for you know not what, your hour, what hour your Lord does come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So we have to be ready at all times. Any of us can go out of here. So we've got to be ready. So the Bible says we don't know the day or the hour. It doesn't say we don't know the year. It doesn't say we don't know the month or even the week. When it is day here, it is night over in Israel or over the other side of the world. We're in a different time zone here than we are over there. Our calendars are even a little different. So even though we don't know the exact day or hour, we will be able to know very close to his return, I believe. And the Bible says he that endureth to the end... So let's review what this peace agreement does. Now, this is a prophecy with a date on it. Under this agreement, the Antichrist and the international community will exist in the Holy Land. A Palestinian state will be created in the West Bank, which is the biblical area of Judea. Currently, there are 600. Many of the Jews presently living in this part of Judea will become a new Palestinian state, will decide to remain in their homes, living as a Jewish minority in Palestine. 
The dispute over the Temple Mount will be solved by placing under a chain arrangement between Muslims and Jews. Israel will build their third temple on the Temple Mount without disturbing the Dome of the Rock or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And Israel's temple will be completed during the final three. First, sorry, first three and a half years after the signing of the agreement. And then halfway through the final seven years, the Antichrist will stand in God. And the scriptures call this the abomination of desolation. So now, so that we know, that is how we know we have a seven-year period and when it will start. So the second part of this, um, next thing that we have is about is the World War III or Six Trumpet War. Now, this is not dependent on the peace treaty whatsoever. This war can break out now. It could break out after the peace treaty. We just know that it has to happen before on the scene at the three-and-a-half-year mark. Now, the question is not, is there going to be a World War III? It's in your Bible. One percent chance that it's not going to happen. Another world war is coming, and it's going to be the biggest war we've ever seen. A voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the river Euphrates. So the four angels that who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. So in verse 15, the King James Version says to slay a third part of men. The New King James Version says to mankind. The Good News Translation says to kill a third of the human race. And then we have the New Living Translation. It says to kill one-third of all people on earth. And all the other translations will agree with that. So we can conclude that the Bible says exactly what it means. A prophecy where one-third of the human race will be wiped out in a war that is coming. In order for us to really understand this, let's put this into perspective. Prior to the 20th century, there had never been one war with a million fatalities. Then came World War I. 8.2 million dead. They said this could never happen again, and then they developed the League of Nations, hoping to prevent something like this from ever happening. But 20 years later, World War II. They didn't have 8.2 million dead, but 52 million people died. They said, how can we ever stop this? So they founded the United Nations and hoped that we had fixed, has this fixed, but guess what? It's not. There's another war coming. 8 million dead. It won't be 52 million dead. This war that's coming is going to be 2.2 billion dead. And I did say billion. We're talking about 40 times World War II, the worst war ever. Now, the Bible doesn't say exactly when this is going to happen, but we know that it has to happen before the Antichrist comes on the scene. Now, let's see what else the Bible says. The Bible tells us that the war will emanate from, if we go back to Revelation 9, 14, it tells us that the war starts the Euphrates River. So where is the Euphrates River? The Euphrates River is in the Middle East, and these are angels that are bound in the Euphrates River. Now, angels are spirits. The Bible tells us that angels are ministering spirits to us who are heirs of salvation. But these angels are not good angels. Rebelled with Satan. So one-third of the angels are evil, and these are part of those evil angels. How do we know for sure? Because they are bound in the river Euphrates. But when they are loose, their assignment is to kill one-third of mankind. Now let's look at where the Euphrates River actually is. So the Euphrates River starts in Turkey up in the north, and then it comes down through Syria. It enters the northern boundary of Iraq. So 60 or 70 percent of the Euphrates River is in Iraq. 2003 when we invaded Iraq. And finally, the Euphrates River is empty into the Persian Gulf. And the Bible says this is where the war will emanate from. Now, it probably won't be contained there because to kill 2.2 billion people, you have to reach a large part of the world. There's a total of 6.8 billion now. The question is, who will be involved in this war? We know that Mao Zedong, the late leader of China, boasted in his diary that he could fill an army of 200 million. Now, Revelation is 916. horsemen was 200 million 
and I heard the number of them. So it's pretty incredible that a godless atheist man would just... Revelations 9, 16. He says we can fill 200 million soldiers. So does that mean that China will somehow be one of the participants of this war? It's very highly likely, but we can't be for sure because there's two other entities in the planet right now that could actually fill 200 million soldiers. We know the Islamic world has a population of about 1.5 billion, and the population of China is about 1.3. So the Islamic world, if they got together they, and began to fight, they could probably field an army of 200 million. And they have to be involved because these rivers in Islamic territory. Now, India has 1.1 billion, so India could possibly put that many soldiers on the battlefield, even though India doesn't appear to be involved in world affairs like Islam and China. America will most likely be involved since we have troops stationed all over the Middle East. Also, we have the firepower to kill 2.2. Now, this war will be nuclear. You can't kill 2.2 billion people without it being nuclear. After this war, I believe we will see people flocking to the churches. We saw this after 9-11. The problem is it didn't last very long. When they come in, that we knew these prophecies of the Bible, and we can show them that the Bible is true. We can show them that Jesus is alive and well. So both the confirmation of the happened before the Antichrist takes power. So once the Antichrist comes to power, in Revelations 12, 13, it says the Antichrist will make war against the woman, Israel. She has 12 stars around. And then in verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. She is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Again, that's three and a half years. Where is Israel's place? It's in the promised land. It's the land promised to Abram, Abraham, and we know Israel is going to stay there safely until the battle. Now the Antichrist will invade Israel, will invade Israel because she has not been under his power before this time. And who is Israel's only friend? The United States. Our veto power at the United Nations to protect Israel for the last 60 years. So it appears that the reason the now this is another prophecy, but I'm not going to be able to. In Daniel, on the beast represents the United States. It is not on the beast in Revelations. It is not there. So it appears it appears some, they're, they're not government system, which is a good thing. Um, and if we're not uh, wiped out in the war, then it's possible that we could be of, of refuge. Now, the Antichrist, and that's true, generally. But yet we have scriptures here in Daniel chapter 11 that explicitly say that there will be those that resist the Antichrist. In verse 32, in Daniel 11, 32, against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those are the people who understand many. So right in the middle of this chaos, after the abomination of desolation during the final three and a half years, people are going to be in full evangelism mode. So since America is not specifically included, included in a one world government, could it be that U.S. becomes evangelism? Let's pray that it does. Daniel 11.40, And at the time of the end shall the king and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries. Now this is probably the west bank of Judea, which is under the control of the Palestinians. And then um, Daniel eleven forty one. Enter also into this glorious land, and many countries will be shall be overthrown, but these that shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, and Moab, and the chief. Of the children of Ammon. Now, the Moab Mountains is central Jordan, and Ammon is Ammon Jordan. So we know Jordan will never be occupied by the Antichrist. Israel, Christ, or else the Antichrist wouldn't have to invade Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. 
So could America also escape? We don't know for sure. But Daniel 11.44 says this, says, But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. The tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none, no one will help him. So the Antichrist is going to have opposition on the national level during the final three and a half years. I, for one, certainly hope it's the United States of America. Safety. There's only one place. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into and they are saved. The Bible says, except a man, person be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. Your only hope, my only hope, is to know where we stand with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, we know we've talked about the confirmation of the covenant which begins this seven years. We've talked about the Antichrist. And now the great tribulation begins in the middle of this three and a half year period, or the seven years. Now, the great tribulation begins three and one half years before the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people believe the great tribulation was seven years before the battle of Armageddon. Um, if you want a seven-year tribulation, you can have it, but I'll take the three and a half because <laughs> that'll definitely be long enough. Now, Jesus seemed to refer to this first half in Matthew 24, 8. He goes, and these are the beginning of sorrows. And so this is why some people commonly refer to the seven-year period as the tribulation or the tribulation period. But you can look up tribulation in the Strong's Concordance, and nowhere will you find that the tribulation is seven years. Let's look at the scriptures that say that great tribulation is three and a half years, since you're probably wondering. Daniel 7.25 says, The little horn, the Antichrist, makes war against the saints for time, times, and half a time. And I also want to point out here that the Antichrist makes war with the saints. So if we're gone, how can he make war with the saints? Now, a time is one year, a times is two years, and half a time is half a year. And how do we know for sure? Well, because another prophecy says the exact same thing, only in a different way. Revelations chapter 13, 5 says the Antichrist in power was given to the beast to continue 42 months. And he makes war against the saints and prevails against them. So in Daniel 7, 25, it says time, times, and half a time. Revelation 13, 5 says 42 months. And then in Revelation 12, 6, it says the dragon makes war against this woman, Israel, for 1,260 days. You divide that up, 1,260 days is three and a half years. And every time we see a time period put on the Great Tribulation, it's three and a half years. Now, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, then let those which be in Judea flee, because there shall be great tribulation, such as never has been before, nor ever again shall be. So this is what End Time Ministries is calling another Jewish Holocaust. This is when the Jews uh, in Judea, Samaria, will be... Um, will be slaughtered. So that's why they really need to get to Israel and get out of that land. Now, Jesus said the great tribulation will begin at the abomination of desolation. And Daniel taught us in Daniel 9, 27, that the abomination of desolation happens halfway through the final seven-year period. So every place we see the time of the great tribulation, it's three and one-half years. Now, there is a seven-year period, and that's what we've been talking about, but the first half of the seven-year period is not tribulation at all. It's the buildup the final three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. This first three and a half years, you're going to see tons of stuff take place regarding your world order, probably one world currency, and, and on and on, building up to this, the middle of the seven-year period. Let's look at Matthew 24, 29 through 31. This describes what happens after the Great Tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of, the, of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall together, together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So who are the elect that he's gathering, that the angels are gathering? Well, it's important to define this. Um, the word elect means chosen, just as it would in common speech today. We elect a president. We are choosing a president to fill that office. 
Now, since the Bible says his elect, the passage is referring to God's chosen people. The question is, therefore, who are the elect? Who are God's chosen people? Many will answer, that's the Jews or the nation of Israel. But that teaching is a little contrary to the word of God. Considering this, follow, this following verse, for example, Romans 11:7. What then, Israel, has not obtained that which he seeketh for? But the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So it is clear from this verse that Israel and the election cannot be the same group of people. The Bible refers to those who are saved as the elect, regardless of Jew or Gentile. 1 Thessalonians 1-4 through 4 says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. So the Gentile Thessalonians are referred as being the elect. But nowhere in the entire Bible are the Jews or the nation of Israel referred to God's elect. To prove this, we can look at every single mention of the word. The first mention of the word elect in the New Testament is in Matthew 24. The study of the word elect or election in the New Testament reveals that every time the word is used, except for elect angels and elect lady, it refers to the church and not the Jews. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and show, shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect so in verse 24 the Bible is telling us that false Christ and false prophets will be convincing in the last days that if it were possible that they would deceive the very elect but by saying if it were possible God is making it very clear that it is not possible the elect will not be deceived by false Christ and false prophets in fact God is saying that it will be impossible and in Matthew 20, uh, chapter 24 it shows us that Jesus Christ placed the rapture immediately after the tribulation of those days for those who believe in a rapture that comes before the tribulation should look at the following scriptures that contain tribulation the New Testament used the term tribulation 22 times the rapture happens before the tribulation shouldn't one of the 22 passages teach us something about the rapture happening before the tribulation? The, ins the answer is, out of 22 instances, there is no clear verse that says the rapture happens the tribulation. There is, however, a very clear verse that says it happens after the tribulation. Matthew 24, 29. It says, immediately after the tribulation the appearance of this phrase great tribulation occurs in the seventh chapter of revelation john sees a great multitude of white robed people praising god around the throne and is told these are they which came out of the great tribulation they have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb that's in revelation 7 14. so they are not protected they have endured the great tribulation and now have now come out rejoicing. It is apparent that all of this happens prior to the return of Christ, which is not actually depicted in chapter 19. So at the end of the tribulation, which is three and a half years, we have a rapture we're all looking for. This is the seventh trump. Let's define the rapture. First Thessalonians 19. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that which we are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shadow of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and ever be with the Lord. So in verse 17, the term caught up is the original Greek word for which means to seize or to snatch up. The Bible does not have the word rapture in it, but when we say rapture, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised corruptible, and we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
Matthew 24, 30 through 31. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man of heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the rapture is this event. The Lord will come in the clouds and send his angels with the sound of the great trumpet and together the saints to him. It is at this time when the saints will be changed from mortal being to immortal, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't know if you understand that, but when you go from mortal to immortal, it means we can fly through, we can go through the atmosphere. We're not going to be here in a twinkling of an eye and be in heaven in a twinkling of an eye. We're going to probably ascend just like Jesus ascended and the disciples were able to see him. Um, but we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye, and that's what that means. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4 clearly says that the Antichrist will be, be revealed before the rapture. And we've already read this verse, so I'm going to just jump down and, and read half of it again. The day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So Revelations 20 through 4, 4 through 6, let's read that now. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast nor his image, neither had received a mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned in Christ a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, and they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this says that the saints that were killed during the mark of the beast would be part of the first resurrection. These verses tell us that the saints that were killed during the tribulation uh, was the first resurrection, like I said. And then it means that the rapture or first re resurrection has to occur after the tribulation. So let's read Revelation 16, 15. This is a last-minute warning. It says, Behold, I come as a thief. But notice the context. The following verse is the battle of Armageddon, the seventh vial. So why would God be issuing a warning that he's coming as a thief right up until Armageddon if he's already come seven years prior to this? This, of course, he wouldn't. This lets us know that the rapture does not happen until after the first six vials or of the wrath of God are poured out, but they are not poured out upon the saints. We remember the children of Israel. Uh, ten plagues were poured out in Egypt, and they were not poured out on, on them. It's going to be the same way. Revelation 12, 12. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he has but a short time. So this verse calls the great tribulation Satan's wrath. After all, God does not persecute his own people. Satan does. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 teaches that God's people are not appointed to God's wrath. So people say, well, we have to be raptured then. But the great tribulation is not God's wrath. It's Satan's. Saints have been persecuted for their faith since the beginning. Eleven of the twelve apostles were martyred. We have saints that were killed in the Catholic Crusades and the Spanish Inquisitions for not denying the name of Jesus Christ and converting to Catholicism. Saints today were not immune to the trials and temptations and persecutions of Satan. It has been said that God wouldn't beat up his bride before marrying her, and that's certainly true. He wouldn't, but Satan would. It has been commonly accepted that in order for the Antichrist to rise to power, then the Holy Ghost must be removed from the earth. But if the Holy Ghost is not on the earth during the Great Tribulation, then what power is being used by the two witnesses to perform all their miracles? Matthew 24, 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Some believe that since God helped his chosen escape the great tribulation of the flood, then he shall rapture his church before the coming tribulation. However, it should be noticed that God protected Noah through the flood. He did not bring Noah into heaven to avoid the flood. So he's going to take us through the tribulation. 
Bible does not contradict itself from one scripture to another. So if everything doesn't line up with what you believe, you have to figure out why it doesn't. Okay, I know I've thrown a lot at you tonight, and I appreciate you for coming out and, and listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, and if I don't know them, I will get to you the answer. I want you to keep an eye out for the peace treaty between Israel and the Palestines. It's very important. Once we see this, the temple will be built, and prophecy will be filled right before our eyes. And then we have this horrific war that can happen at any time. We need to be praying for our military. We need to be praying for people that we know that are in the military. I know, I know, in time scares a lot of people, but I want to leave you with a few verses. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with the righteous right hand. It's Isaiah 41.10. And then John 14.27. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried. Do not be upset. Do not be afraid. God has everything under control. We don't have to be afraid no matter what is coming our way. Thank you. Turn it back over to Pastor Steve.